they get better when they play, not when the conductor talks. It's perhaps a little challenging and confronting for us as conductors to actually realize that. We think that our words are the most powerful thing in the entire world. We might like to think that, but actually, in reality, the more the orchestra plays together, the better they are going to sound. Hi there! Welcome back to another episode of the Conductors Podcast. I'm your host Chao Wenting, and my guest today is the very special person who is my longtime partner in crime, Dr. Caroline Watson. And you can tell from my tone that I'm really excited to talk to her. We first met at the Dallas Opera's Heart Institute for Women Conductors, and I don't think she would oppose me telling you that, but. The year when we met, she was actually not one of the fellows. She was there as an observer or an auditor. And in the next year, she reapplied and became a fellow. The second year, so this story tells us, you know, like we conductors and musicians feel rejections, you know, like no's, and sometimes we feel those are failures, but. Don't just reapply and retry it. And I can tell you, I didn't get in the first time when I applied for the Dallas Opera program. I also got in the second year that I applied. So just keep trying. Sometimes the universe is just not ready for you yet, or sometimes they take someone over you because of other things that just not directly related to conducting abilities or conducting levels. It does never hurt to try again to reach out to people, and Caroline has been a great friend since we co-hosted the Maestro as Professor series during the pandemic, which was a series of free webinars when we talked to each other and we did presentations and also interviewed our colleagues about many many aspects of the college orchestra conductor positions. And she also helped me organizing the very first Girls Who Conduct Women Conductor Symposium last year, and all the recordings are still available if you want to watch. We had a lot of awesome discussions. But what I have heard in our show today is about something that is very specific and particular. I wanted her to talk about conducting study, which is a Really broad topic, and also something that is very personal and individualized because everyone has a very special and unique path. But today we are going to focus on conducting masterclasses, festivals, workshops, and she will also share how she pick a select student going into her conducting studio and、I、like her philosophy of teaching and mentoring conductors. So, without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, hello, welcome so much, and Kel, I'm so excited to see you again. Welcome to the Conductors Podcast. Thank you, Chao Wen. I'm super excited to be here. So, before we get started, can you give everybody just a brief intro, a little bit about your background and how you get to where you are right now? Okay, sure. So my name is Carolyn Watson. I'm originally from Australia.、Uh, my musical journey began at the age of five when I started as a violinist with the Suzuki Method. And throughout my childhood, I played violin. I played in orchestras. I always wanted actually to teach violin and to play violin professionally. And I was very happy that that was something I was able to do after my undergraduate degree. So I did a double degree as an undergraduate,、uh, majoring in music education and violin performance, and then I went to Europe. I spent some time in Hungary at the Kodály Institute, then spent some time in Germany before coming back to Australia and、uh, securing a teaching job. And from that position, I found myself working more and more with young musicians in instrumental ensembles. In youth orchestras, and that sort of sparked an interest in conducting. And so I had some lessons, and then that turned into a master's degree, which turned into a doctoral degree. And yeah, I guess he, here we are, sort of all of those those years later. I was not actually originally intending to pursue conducting as a career. It found me rather than me finding it. You know, I, I think a lot of my identity was very much tied up as a violinist. You know, that was part of my life since a very very 
young age and a very big part of my life. So it was quite difficult, I think, to consider perhaps a switch and or maybe breaking up with violin, as it were, to pursue conducting, which at that time I felt I didn't know very much about. But yeah, it's kind of worked out okay. So I moved to the United States in 2013, so almost nine years ago now. And I moved over from Australia after a a period of time, you know, studying, finishing my doctoral degree, spending quite a bit of time in Europe, gaining, you know, practice assistance, you know, assistantships, studying scores, doing master classes. And yes, I, I moved over for the job that was heading up the Interlochen Arts Academy Orchestra, Interlochen Center for the Arts. And I have held various positions in institutions following Interlochen. I was at Texas State University, most recently the University of Kansas, and starting in August the University of Illinois. Congratulations. It's so exciting. I probably didn't tell you that. I almost went to that program. Oh, you did not. That was the school where I took my first live audition <laughs> more than 10 years ago. And I think I was waitlisted and then I went to another school and then I wanted to transfer. It didn't work out. And if I had transferred, I would have to wait for two more years because Dr. Schleiger was going on sabbatical. So she told me not to wait anymore. <laughs> that place has a like a dear spot in, in my heart. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm very excited. So you said that conducting found you. Was there any like pivotal events that happened or something prompt you thinking that you're actually good at it or it's possible for you to look into that career path Wait, what happened since you were such a good violinist? That's a very good question. So yes, to answer your question, there was a pivotal event and that was in 2007, the summer I spent in Aspen at the American Academy of Conducting. At that time, I had finished my master's study in conducting at the conservatorium in Sydney. And I still, in spite of having studied that degree, was not intending to pursue conducting professionally. And one of the reasons I applied to Aspen, you know, conducting was a passion, an interest, a, a hobby, I guess, alongside my professional violin activities and what I was doing as a teacher. And part of the thing that really enticed me to apply for the Aspen program was being able to do both of those things together, namely play in an orchestra as a violinist and continue my growth and development as a as as a conductor and so I got there just really really excited to be able to do both of those things and yeah I think I that was probably the point at which I looked around me and kind of thought wow this conducting thing perhaps I I should take it seriously so that was very much the turning point for me and I went home to Australia after that experience and kind of thought okay it feels like the universe is sending me a very clear message here Perhaps I need to be receptive to that message because up until that time, I, I perhaps was closed, not really open to the possibility, possibly a little afraid of the unknown, as it were, you know, and uh, decided that, yes, I would take a chance, as it were, and, and see about uh, a career as a conductor. That is awesome. You didn't tell me about this at all yet. <laughs> Glad we are finding this out now because we are talking about workshops and also like studying conducting and every conductor's wannabe know it's so hard to get any practical experience and it's nothing compared to having life musicians and good mentors guiding you the way. So was Aspen your first conducting masterclass-ish setting? Yes, I would say it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I might have done um, sort of a very short afternoon workshop and or a sort of introductory one before that in Australia. But in terms of major, major conducting masterclasses, yes, it was it was Aspen. So I'm a very intensive experience. At that time, it was nine weeks. So a very lengthy summer program, a very uh, program with a wonderful reputation that was still when David Zinman was in charge. So I worked with him and Murray Sidlin over the course of the summer. It was in many ways uh, the best summer of my life, but also it was a very challenging time for me. I think quite confronting always when you're pushed outside of your comfort zone. Um, and there was a lot of that. Uh, there was a lot of that happening. Of course, I look back now and I see how necessary it was, but it wasn't necessarily the easiest experience, at least for me personally, where I was at that time. So looking back to all those workshops, masterclasses, alike or that you've been to, what was the most important thing that you learned or the biggest takeaway? 
And I think I learned different things from different masterclasses and also at different points in time. And Aspen was certainly very formidable and, and formative, sorry, in terms of understanding the broader context in which music making happens and the expectations of professional musicians and how to manage time on the podium, things that perhaps you don't necessarily get the experience of, you know, when you're in school, no matter how wonderful your your school is, because obviously there's differences in working with student musicians and working with professional musicians. So in terms of, I guess, a little bit more background and context, that was very, very helpful. I also had a wonderful experience the year after Aspen, in fact, um, working with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and mentor by the name of Martin Brabens, who's now music director of the English National Opera. And that was way up in the north of um, Scotland in the Orkney Islands. It was a festival that was founded by Peter Maxwell Davies, the St. Magnus Festival. And they had a composer's session that later morphed into a composers and conductors session. I'm not quite sure, to be honest, whether it it still exists. I believe the festival, the St. Magnus Festival does, but I'm not sure whether there is still that conducting component. But that was a very, a very uh, wonderful experience as well. Yeah. So looking back into how you had selected the program, or even now, if you are advising your students, looking for experience during the summertime or to get even footage for a lot of conductors that you go to master classes or workshops because you can conduct a full orchestra playing some real repertoire. What are the things that you think we should consider when you are choosing an event like this? Well, I think it's a very personal kind of decision and different people look for different things. Everybody has different objectives. And yeah, just like you said, I think some people go to masterclasses specifically to get video footage because as you recognize, as we all know, it is quite challenging to get that opportunity and that time up in front of a professional orchestra. So in that sense, uh, masterclasses that provide that opportunity are really, really wonderful for young conductors. On the other hand, I know some people really want to study with uh, particular conducting professors and or maestri who have wonderful reputations. So they perhaps seek out master classes based on the particular conductor or mentor who is leading them. Other people might want, for example, to work with a particular orchestra, like you said, a full orchestra or maybe a chamber orchestra, depending on that. Other people may well be interested in masterclasses on specific repertoire, the symphonies of Beethoven, the symphonies of Brahms, the ballets of Stravinsky, for example. And, you know, from a practical side, I guess cost is also a factor because typically where professional orchestras are involved for the most part, there's quite a cost involved to the the participant to obviously offset the paying of the orchestra members for the purposes of that masterclass. Yeah. So we know that different teachers teach very, very differently. I've had teachers talking about philosophical choices and music interpretations. They are mentors known for teaching a specific types or schools of techniques. And they are also, I just say, famous mentors. as like some people that everybody wants to get into their program. Now you are also teaching and mentoring students yourself. Okay, I want to ask something that everybody wants to know. What do you look for in conducting videos when you pre-screen them? Yeah, great question. And again, I think different people possibly look for different things. I mean, for me, what's important is to be able to see some kind of connection between the conductor and the musicians, um, and ideally to be able to see some kind of musical intent. It doesn't matter to me so much that perhaps there's not so much of a developed technique But really, if somebody has a very clear musical conviction, I feel that that comes across regardless of where they are in their conducting training or their their musical journeys. I guess that's what I I, I look for as, as number one. I think that, you know, solid musicianship is really the foundation for success as a conductor. I mean, there's so many factors in, involved in success as a conductor, but, um, to, you know, many of them somehow a little hard to define and, and depending on circumstances and, and all of those sorts of things. But I think a, a solid musical basis and or a foundation of musicianship is, is a great starting point. So you're looking for good musicians. I am. And no matter this person can conduct yet or not, it doesn't matter that much to you. No, it doesn't. 
Yeah, um, it, it doesn't because I think when you have that musical experience, it's, uh, as I said, it's a good starting point. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's a little bit like someone who's got a good foundation, technical foundation on their instrument, then you can work with them musically. Of course, conducting is a little bit different in that, you know, it is a physical language. It's a like learning a, a new instrument. And in many ways, it is the accumulation, I guess, of those years of musical musical experience that then manifests itself in a, a physical presence and, and, you know, body language and gestures and all of those sorts of things. But yeah, I guess when we consider the, you know, the technique of conducting, I don't know that it's particularly difficult to teach and or to develop. I think, yeah, and particularly when you're working with really well, highly trained musicians that have got great ears, able to hear and have a, a sound concept and blend of orchestral sound. Those are, yeah, really good points on which to build, I think. So do you ask for rehearsal footages or if you do, what are you wanting to see in a rehearsal footage? I guess what I want to see is how people interact with the, the musicians. Again, the connection there, the kinds of things that they work on, what they say, what they don't say, how their requests and how their instructions to the players relate to what I've just heard and hopefully what they have also just heard. Because, uh, you, you know, I mean, if you're kind of asking for finer nuance of dynamics and your ensemble's not together and playing the wrong rhythm and there's major major foundations, you know, that are not in place with regard to pitch or intonation, then perhaps uh, it's a little misplaced. You know, there's maybe more pressing items that address the need to be addressed first. So I guess I want to see that the person has a sense of an awareness of what's actually going on and is reacting to the sound that the ensemble is producing rather than say a, a, a very well scripted or prepared rehearsal, you know, at letter X try and do this, you know, faster vibrato when maybe at letter X, you know, the, the bassoon didn't come in, for example. That is great. And I love your answers so much. I wish a lot more teachers are picking students based on the criteria that you just described. So I wanted to ask about your conducting program because you headed the conducting program at KU and now you're taking over and um, Urbana Champaign. So can you tell us a little bit about your program? For example, do you differentiate the levels of master's and doctoral students and how, how you train those conductors? Gosh, big question. So I think everybody is different and I don't necessarily want a, I certainly don't want a studio of conductors that look all like me or all like each other. And I think I look for people who are able to, as I said, express musicianship and people that I feel I'm able to help on their journey where they are. In terms of differentiating between master's and doctoral level, I mean, I would not expect necessarily a big differentiation in, in musicianship and or those sorts of things, but obviously there's going to be less experience for people applying for a master's level than a doctoral level. Ideally, applying for doctoral level, I would like people to have some real world, real life professional kind of experience working with people, working with orchestras, whether that be youth orchestras, community orchestras, teaching experience in a, a K-12 kind of program, but something other than, than just school. Because I think the thing about conducting, you develop as a conductor when you develop as a person. And uh, that's also an important thing. And in teaching the conductors, do you use pianist or a string quartet or I have a small lab ensemble. I know you are just starting out, but kind of in your most ideal way, if you have all the money and resources, how will you want to build the program? So I think there's a, a number of different ways to go about doing that. Um, I mean, practical experience and podium time is unquestionably super, super important. So I try to give as much to my students as is absolutely possible. When I do that, I will have them on the podium leading the orchestra and I will simply sit as a member of the horn section and take notes. I typically don't interrupt them on the podium. I find that they are, you know, they can get in the flow, they can do their work without feeling scrutinized and, and 
potentially criticized, you know, or that kind of thing. It's very helpful, I think, for the orchestra to see them as a conductor rather than a conducting student. So I take notes and then meet with them afterwards. Yes, at the University of Illinois, one of the things and one of the reasons that really attracted me to this particular position was, in fact, the possibility of running a conducting course that does use a seminar with real live musicians. So it's wonderful to have a lab orchestra with whom the conducting students will work twice a week. So it's a chamber chamber orchestra with a core of string players and a core of wind players and then pianos covering the the additional parts and for two hours twice a week the graduate orchestral conductors will workshop repertoire in that setting. That is wonderful. I wish I had all this when I was going to school. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a luxury. But I wanted to shift the topic a little bit since you talked about repertoire. And as conductors, we know it's hard and it's important to build your repertoire. And when you are just starting out, it's difficult because you're either given the assignments by your teacher or when you go to workshops, you have to do whatever the orchestra is preparing for. So what would you suggest to young conductors of building their workshop, both in terms of like practically who they have access to that they can work on? And also on top of that, what can they do? I know uh, repertoire and learning it and building those repertoire lists is definitely a big part of that development for a young conductor. I guess, though, I think maybe a word of caution in that I think it's better to perhaps do perhaps smaller scale things and do them well rather than perhaps, you know, have or try to get a really huge experience like doing the Rite of Spring for, you know, for argument's sake, before you might be ready in terms of musical and, and technical experience. Um, everybody's different. There are some people that are just like, yep, sure, Strauss tone forms, I'm going to jump right in. Why not? And th- that's where workshops can be very, very good. But, you know, for the young conductor, I don't know that it's a, that much of a typical case scenario where, in fact, you would be offered the opportunity to first up conduct either the Rite of Spring or a Strauss tone poem. That's not to say that you should not learn them. You, you most definitely should. But there's just, I think, all kinds of experiences that can be valuable and really learning both the art and the craft of conducting in terms of what it means to study a score, like what it really means to, to know a score, what it means to be able to rehearse a piece and to, to get a really great sound out of your ensemble because I think there's a very good chance that if you you know you, you do get some professional work as a conductor very likely it may well be uh, when you're starting out with a community orchestra a semi-professional orchestra a youth orchestra and perhaps if you do get some work with a great uh, you know really high level orchestra it's likely going to be education concerts pops concerts where you have possibly one one rehearsal only and in that time you've really got to do you've got to work very very efficiently to get through absolutely everything and to be able to get it to perform performance standards. So I think, you know, there's different ways of of going about things, but I think the quality of your work should be a a number one consideration more so than the quantity when it comes to filling out a a big repertoire list, because there's, there's time for that. There's time to grow and develop as a conductor. I totally agree with you. And then I am a little bit happy that the pandemic put that stop, that, that practice into a stop for a little bit because I felt, I don't know if you would agree, that before pandemic, we saw so many workshops opening up for a really, really big repertoire and you just pay and conduct and, and look good in the sense while it pushes conducting into a very expensive training process. If you can't afford this, it, it almost felt like you had no chance to compete or compare with those candidates. So kind of coming back a little bit. So as you say, you would like the doctoral candidates to have some real life experience, but we know it's hard to get a job or even some position of any kind. How do you feel about uh, candidates mostly building their experience through workshops and master classes? And how do you compare a footage that's with a full orchestra playing standard rep as opposed to someone maybe just gather a few friends singing something or even a wind ensemble repertoire, not an orchestral repertoire, that kind of footage. If you do have a professional orchestra that sounds great that you're able to work with, I mean, 
yes, obviously that does make a very good impression. But on the other hand, I think there are, you know, people such as myself and my colleagues that are in many cases much more experienced than me in terms of conducting teaching and pedagogy. And I think they are, we are all able to see, you know, when in fact the orchestra is responding to the conductor or whether the orchestra is playing and the conductor is, as you said a little while ago, just there to to look good as it were. I mean, I personally encourage my students to be very proactive and put together their own ensembles. It is the best way to get experience and it also helps you manage all of the other associated logistics with being a conductor, potentially being a music director, namely convincing people to play for you, convincing people to buy into your energy, your dream, your passion, all of those sorts of things. And for me, that also kind of says, hey, I'm really interested in this so much so that I'm going to go to all of this extra effort in order to make it happen. And yeah, I agree with you. I mean, masterclasses, they can tend to be very expensive. And for that reason, they tend potentially to maybe exclude some people. There might not be people who, for example, are able to take a whole summer off work for, you you know, to go and study. So there is definitely that consideration. So I try not to be necessarily, you know, influenced by big name orchestras on CVs and people that have done lots and lots of master classes in the, you know, because I, I think uh, there's just so many different ways to the podium. And again, that drive, that energy and that connection with the musicians, that often speaks a lot too. I just love everything that you say today. I'm so... <laughs> And I'm so happy for you to be chairing that program because I felt a lot of the young conductors would be really fortunate and be to be nurtured by you and your program. So I want to just ask if you have any memorable stories about workshops that you've been to that you want to share or some teaching from a master's that you felt would be good for our audience to hear. Yes. I I mean, I have many memorable stories. I'm not quite sure how many of them I should actually share, but I think probably the thing that really, really stood out was at the end of that summer with David Zinman. And he's a man of a few words, as anybody that's worked with him knows. And we, like all young, and uh, when I say we, myself particularly at that point, I was very inexperienced and I did what a lot of colleagues there and other young conductors do, which was talk way too much. And, you know, I think that's likely, and I see it in in students and applications to graduate programs, it's because you feel you have to explain when you can't necessarily show physically with your, your gestures because your body language, your conducting vocabulary is perhaps not that advanced. So David Zinman came up at the end of those nine weeks and, you know, wanted to just give us a sort of a, a takeaway. And his number one takeaway was don't talk. Number two was know the score. Number three, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And and that really, really absolutely stayed with me. At that time, I don't think I really appreciated how valuable podium time absolutely is and what he actually meant by don't talk. But now when I, I see my students and I watch conducting videos, I just find myself getting so impatient so quickly and thinking, oh my gosh, why are you talking so much? <laughs> I love that. And I was just speaking to a friend because we were watching different conductors. And I sometimes found some conductors very good at rehearsing. I don't know, like we have a tournament in China. It it means like you have your priorities that's wrong, that you're talking so much because you're good at it. You're good at changing things by telling people what to do instead of just showing it. They don't think so much about techniques even though we know like techniques is not everything, but it's important if you can show it, you will have saved so much time. <laughs> and I I want to hear all the stories. Do you have another one that you want to share? Or I can ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that for me, that was the most memorable and also the most helpful in many ways. Because I think you have to keep in mind, you know, an orchestra, any orchestra, be they a community orchestra or the New York Philharmonic, they get better when they play, not when the conductor talks. It's perhaps a little challenging and 
confronting for us as conductors to actually realize that we think that our words are the most powerful thing in the entire world. We might like to think that, but actually in reality, the more the orchestra plays together, the better they are going to sound. I'm going to put that on my door. (laughs) (laughs) The ensemble works better when they play, not when you talk. (laughs) It's very, it's very true. I think I might get one of those little plaques made up my office, my desk. Or yeah, maybe just don't talk. Don't talk is a lot direct. I think like people, I don't know, sometimes I thought young people don't really understand why you tell them not to talk. And then they got nervous anyways. So that's why they start to talk and then they don't feel they are really expressing or really making it clear what they wanted. And then they want to explain more and then it's, it's more. <laughs> So if you have a student that talks so much on the podium while you say you mostly take notes and don't interrupt them, how do you coach students into not to talk so much? So first of all, I think awareness is key because most of the you know students that come into graduate programs, they, they bring their own experience. And it may well be from uh, working with community orchestras and working with youth orchestras, working with their school orchestras, working with professional orchestras. And I guess everybody does things their own way until perhaps they know another way. You know what I mean? And that's not to say that their way is bad. It's just to say that perhaps there's a more efficient way and another way of doing things. And I mean, as we know, as conductors, what we we do depends and varies widely according to the environment and the particular orchestra that we are working with. An orchestra that's never played a program before is going to be a very different kind of thing than an orchestra that just performed it last week and you know you're, you're brought in to, to do the run out. So first of all, I try to make them aware that time on the podium is very valuable and that it needs to be used very effectively. And you know, in the feedback that I give them, I just keep mentioning the same thing, keep mentioning the same thing. And you know, sometimes when I am sitting up the back of the room or you know from my spot as assistant principal horn, observing them on the on the podium I'll give some kind of physical gesture that will suggest that they should keep it moving that they're maybe talking a little bit too much that time is perhaps and the rehearsal the pace of the rehearsal that's also a big consideration because I mean if players are not engaged then they tend to switch off and you know you, you ideally want everybody paying attention and one of the ways that you can do that is to engage everybody of course by playing and or also not by talking so much. I love that your gesture, people don't see you, but that was <laughs> that was great. Just keep going, keep going. That was wonderful. So just to wrap up, do you have something that you want to tell the young conductors? Some words of encouragement, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Some words of encouragement. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah, it's a challenging profession. I think most people entering it are perhaps hopefully aware of some of the challenges that are inherent in making a career as a, as an artist, as a musician, and certainly as a conductor. If it's your passion, if it's the only thing you can see yourself doing, it's what you want to do, then go for it. I mean, that's just what you need to do. And I think there's so many different ways to the podium. That's not to say that just because you don't land an assistant job with a professional orchestra straight out of school that you will not have a conducting career. That has not been my experience at all. I think there are different ways and everybody's journey is different. It's not necessarily a linear path. There's perhaps going to be some potholes or roadblocks along the way. You may well have to take a good number of detours but if that's, you know, if it's your path and it's what you want to do, then follow it. Great. Wonderful. And I will put this in the show notes, but I wanted them to hear it from you. So can you tell everybody where they can find you if they want to reach out? Sure. I'm quite easy to find. You can Google me, Carolyn Watson Conductor, and you will find my website, which is www.carolyn-watson.com. And I'm also easy to find on Facebook. I'm music director of the Laporte County Symphony Orchestra in Indiana. You can also find my biography there. There's a contact site on my website as well. My Twitter handle is Kazakarian. And yeah, that's me. That's where I am. Thank you so much for coming, Caroline. Thank you. My pleasure.
Here you have it, my friends, and I hope the information that she shared was useful for you. And you know what? Every time you go into a conducting masterclass, workshop, or festival, don't feel shy to reach out to the main teacher and ask about why they selected you or why you didn't get in the first time, and then now you get in the second time or the third time or the fourth time you tried. It's always great to get some honest feedback. And don't take it personal. You know, sometimes it's about the circumstances, and sometimes we are not ready yet, professionally or musically, to take on a certain opportunity. And it doesn't mean the end of the world. Also, if you haven't checked it out, episode number thirty three zero is the one that I talked about all the questions I got asked about conducting videos. And as I said in that particular episode, and also what Caroline said today, people evaluating you will have very different ideas about what they are looking for, based on the program that you are applying for, the position that you are applying for, or something in particular that they are looking at. For some teaching or educational programs, such as a workshop or graduate degree. The teachers will be looking for someone who they can get along with, and also someone they can help. So it's not necessary that they are looking for the best conducting students, the best candidates already. While if you are applying for a job, they will want to make sure that whoever they take as a finalist has the required ability, both conducting wise and musically and professionally, that can take on the task. So again, I hope this episode was useful for you and also fun to listen to, as I had a lot of fun talking to my dear friend. If you've been liking the show, I would appreciate it if you can leave a review on Apple Podcast. Just borrow a phone or an iPad from a friend if you don't own a Mac product, or just share it with any friends who you think would really benefit from what we are sharing here. Again, have a lovely week, and I will see you again next week at the same time, same place. Bye for now.